Do you have questions about life, existence, different things like that that you want answered? Well, you're in luck because today for three easy payments of twenty nine ninety five. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, this is the Existential Stoic Podcast, though. And today we're doing another episode on fun philosophical questions to get you thinking and even answers from a philosopher and, uh, you know, a non-philosopher. So, oh, doctor. Is, <laughs> doctor. There we go. And it's this is the Existential group, Stoic Podcast. <laughs> yeah, a health person. This is the Existential yeah. Stoic Podcast. I'm Randy. That's Danny. What's going on, Danny? What's up, Randy? Yeah, so we had so much fun doing this last week, and it was such a hit episode that we're going to do some more of these because these questions are awesome, and they're a lot of fun. And there's a ton of them. <laughs> so we barely scratched the surface. Yeah, there's 200-some questions. <laughs> so we're going to be doing this episode for the next, like, 10 months. This is this is season four. <laughs> <laughs> right. Next 10 months. <laughs> awesome. Well, I guess we'll just get right into it. And... uh Oh, here's a great one. This one I actually asked my grandfather when I was like six years old uh, in in different, you know, terminology. But the question is, how do you know you're not dreaming right now? Hmm. And and my grandfather, he was a smart dude. And I asked him, I was like, can you prove that you're not a figment of my imagination? And he was like, no, can't. That is, that's the problem with subjective experience, isn't it? I mean, we're subjects experiencing the world to like, no, it's interesting. This has always been an interesting question. A lot of philosophers have like dealt with this. There's the uh, very famous um, one, the guy wrote, it was uh, the experience machine, you know, where they imagine like basically like Matrix style kind of thing, you know, um, that gets used a lot to that movie because it's a good example of it. But, you know, think about it. If the if the dream was good enough or if the virtual reality was good enough, there'd not be any way to know. And we can't really know, you know. We're only aware of what's within our realm of experience. And, you know, it's hard to prove concretely that this isn't something other than what it is. Not to mention, too, the world could be, in reality, very different than how it appears to us, too. So that could also be a way of, you know, like our brains manipulating what we're actually seeing. And we also don't see all of reality because a lot of things are outside of our experience. We don't see certain wavelengths. We don't see, you know, we can only see things of a certain size. So there's lots of stuff that's just unknown, you know. Hmm. yeah plus a lot of enlightened people have said that you know this is just a dream and uh you know sometimes when sometimes it's funny when i get really sleepy at night so like sometimes the last like three hours of my night i'm just exhausted and so things don't <laughs> consciously make sense anymore yeah. I feel like a little child walking around but all of a sudden I'm, I'm looking at life and i'm like hang on this is kind of am i dreaming what's going on here because like stuff stops making sense the way yeah. it does normally and also, if you've ever done any psychedelics, like you realize yeah. how we we have these uh, frameworks that we think is reality and life and dream, and yeah. all of a sudden you do those and everything shifts. So well, yeah, I don't think you realize too. I think when you do psychedelics too, you realize that all of what we're experiencing is so much dependent on the chemical reactions in our brain, and you manipulate those, you manipulate those things. I, I remember reading a study too where they actually like I figured how they, they were able to give like memories to mice. Uh, in a certain way of how to solve a problem, like a maze. And it was using, like, they basically figured out the electrical signals or whatever. I'm not sure exactly how they did, but like. Aren't they, are, remember, there's like nematodes or something that ha can get the memory of other things by eating it. Really? <laughs> yeah, that's sure. crazy. If that's true, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, the world's crazy, but that's just it. Like, it's insane. So, you know, it's hard. You can't prove it with certainty. You just got to kind of take it with a grain of salt, I guess. Yeah, but I don't think we can prove this isn't a dream. Uh, and, you know, it's it's one of those things where, like, very rarely. So I I remember I used to mess around with lucid dreaming. And it was a strange, it was the craziest thing. Because cool. you, you spend so much time trying to recognize when you're dreaming. And then all of a sudden you do. And it's like a party when you're doing. But Yeah, it's fun. It's, I've done that before too many it's times. It's a lot yeah. of work. But the thing is, there's, like, it's very difficult to bridge that gap between, like, waking life and dreaming life you have to just do things regularly when you're waking that all of a sudden by accident you do when you're sleeping and you recognize that you're dreaming but yeah. uh it's i mean it could be the same thing with life and death yeah it could be some people have talked yeah. about too like you know like uh death as being like you know uh coming away from the dream and stuff of life or something like that you know that kind of terminology so yeah yeah like the best sleep you get the most relaxing yeah mm-hmm 
good question though. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this then. All right. Can predestination and free will coexist? <laughs> what the heck is predestination? Oh, like fate. Think of it like fate. Predestination is like, you know, where um oh. you're dest predestined for a certain place thing. Usually it's ref- predestination, I should say, is usually um in reference to like uh I think some some Christians believe that it's like certain souls are predestined for heaven, uh, you know, so they have no uh-huh. cho- it's not that it's not a matter of your choices. It's already determined. Right. So uh-huh. instead of using predestination, let's just say like uh, fate or like, you know, um, causality is that, you know, can that and free will coexist? Uh, I kind of think, OK, this is bear with me for a second, because yeah, this is kind of crazy answer. So I kind of think that both of them exist simultaneously. Like where you are right now, you were predestined to get here because you can't change that. But your future from this moment forward, that can be free will because you have all these choices available and it's up to you to what to do. But no matter where you are, so like if you look now, everything up until now is predestined, but everything from now on is free will. But same person this is like the crazy quantum mechanic field of it is that 90 you're 90 years old you take a look it turns out that everything up until 90 was predestined and then after that everything is free will so then you have to wonder that time between where you are now and 90 well that's both free will and predestined so they both exist simultaneously it's a good response i like that yeah i actually i think they do too i think it's a matter of perspective there was a uh vast and Frost and name is. Um, he wrote an article on the compatibilism between determinism and free will. And basically, what he said was like, imagine like you have a choice between A and B, right? And imagine before you choose, I'm going to see somebody puts a chip in your brain that if you choose A, it'll make you choose B. That's the only time it's activated. But you choose B. So you had no choice but to choose B, unbeknownst to you, right? Because you couldn't have cho- chosen A, but you did choose B. So technically, it's still a free choice, even though you didn't have a choice. Does that make sense? Mm, it's a very shorthand version of it. One. And I think that's kind of how it works, because Nietzsche talked about fate this way, too, where he said, like, you know, authenticity is basically getting to a place in your life where you're choosing what's right for you, that you're choosing essentially what you would have chosen anyway, or you what you're choosing is what you would have done anyway, because it's you. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. so they they see it as compatible and consistent similar to what you're saying too i think we're like the past determines who we are so we are that person we are there's no changing that and that we have this like freedom to choose and you know in some sense choosing right is choosing who we are you know moving forward if that makes sense yeah there was there's a saying dave ramsey this financial guy i remember he once said he's like pray like it depends on god and work like it depends on you and i like that one <laughs> Because it's like way. you're, yeah, you're taking care of both items. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's also like a matter of perspective. Like, even if it is all determined, like we don't know it, so we just act like it's free, right? And choose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So the next one, what determines success versus failure? Success versus what failure. determines success versus failure? Well, you have to get A's. Yeah, <laughs> clearly how much money you make. <laughs> yeah, right. What car? If you're driving a Tesla, uh... <laughs> you know this is this is honestly a question I wish we thought about more. I know we we've, we've done some stuff on it, but like I think our conception of success is so important in how we think of our lives, and I think it's such we have such a messed up one right now because it is all it's all really like the only metric we use is money. We basically, determine that right. Like how much you make of your job, how much you have, how many objects you own, you know, all that stuff, rather than like all the other things that make a life a life. So I think like how you determine success and failure, I don't know. I think that metric depends on the person. And I think it can vary from case to case. Like, you know, like if I was, you know, for instance, when I was, you know, when I was really struggling, you know, just doing anything during a day, I would consider it an achievement, a success, right? Because I was having such a hard time getting things done. I wouldn't do that now because now I feel better and now I'm getting a lot more done. But so I think that you have to kind of determine a metric that works for you. That's reasonable. And that helps you understand the goals you're trying to achieve and puts them into like some context. Yeah. It's also, it's it's also like just a bad way to evaluate yes. things <laughs> yeah. because it's, you know, it's, 
success and failure are related to a point in time. Like, yeah. for instance, if you want to be good at anything, you're going to have to screw up, make mistakes a whole bunch in order to get there. Like anything worth being good at is worth being terrible at until you can get there. And so yeah. you're going to have a whole bunch of these failures that if you take a snapshot in time and have this giant metric that you're supposed to hit, be like, this is the failure. I'm a failure. Oh, I'm so stupid. <laughs> and then, but if you look at it over the long term, if you keep going, you accumulate, you learn from these failures. Eventually you get to be a quote unquote success. And I would even say that success is way more dangerous than failure because yeah. success breeds complacency. It breeds egotism, all these negative qualities that you really don't want. That's like the dangerous side. No, and you're right too. Like every time, if you think back to any time you're successful, you just basically called all the times you failed in that process learning. So it's just a matter of perspective, right? So I think like that's the other thing because the only times we succeed is when we fail a bunch. We always fail in the process. So yeah, I think you're right. And I think also your point about the uh, success being like toxic like that is true, I think. It gives us a really bad, you know, just a lot of negative things come with it. And it can also lead to us kind of like leveling off because we think we're done. Like we act like it's like finished when nothing is. We're still alive, so we have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, while I was talking, I didn't think about my other one. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Well, while you're talking about it, okay. because it's kind of it's kind of like the, the MC Hammer versus Vanilla Ice type of thing. Like MC Hammer had two songs, and one of them being the Ninja Turtle rap. Or no, that was Vanilla Ice. MC that Hammer had one Ice. song. Vanilla Ice had maybe a couple songs, but I don't know where I'm going with this. Did you find one okay. yet? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, hold on. Yeah, sorry. Um, oh, here's a good one. This is an interesting one that I think people do struggle with sometimes. Is is it possible to make moral judgments without religion? Mm. No, you need religion. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I mean, this is kind of absurd. Like the th the thing that irks me is that religions messed up so freaking bad mm -hmm. like so bad when they had people like messing with little boys and they didn't just that wasn't a good time no. and they literally didn't just flay and skin those people alive publicly yeah. like when that when that happened that just that was the nail in the coffin for religion they've been they've been messing up for a long time but that was kind of the nail in the coffin for it and you know it's it's funny because i look back like I read the Bible and one of the things is like religion has been messing up since the beginning of time. Yeah. Like yeah. it's not, it's well, not it's anything people. new. Yeah. yeah. Like even, even when Jesus was around, he would talk about all like the, I think it was the Sanhedrin or whoever, or I, I don't know, all these guys who basically they were, they were just in religion because they became the most popular person by doing it. And it's just like. Even his own disciples they, screwed up time and time again. Like, yeah. you know, yeah, look at too. It. you know, it's funny. Well, here's the thing. It's funny. Like, it's like people make this mistake all the time where religion is not morality. It might endorse a specific view of morality, but it's not morality. Those are two distinct things. And so it's I think it's, it's totally possibly moral without religion. Religion can help people, I think, if correct. But, you know, a big problem with that, too, is then you think you have moral authorities. So you end up doing things without you actually internalizing it or thinking about it. You know, I think morality has to come from you. It can't come from an external source that you're, you know, conforming to because then you're not really doing it. You know, you're well, doing it because you're afraid of consequences. It's like the distinction between being righteous and self-righteous. Yeah. And it's yeah. like a very fine distinction, but like religious people err on the side of self-righteous all the time. Yeah. They're like, I'm a crusader. Blah. And yeah. it's like, okay, why don't you just act good? Like, I mean, this is the thing about, I think, leadership in general is most people think they they want they want just like the celebrity of leadership but i heard it said a while ago where like the best leader when they're done doing their job the people will think they did it themselves it's like lead yeah. by example and just shut up but a lot of people with religion they start crusading for all this stuff that like yeah it's great but you don't i mean a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still 
And yeah. so you're not going to do anything by just crusading. Well, you know, it also leads to is a lot of virtue signaling, too, where something bad happens. Everybody jumps online to say, oh, we care. But they don't really care. They're not doing anything. Thoughts and prayers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. They're not doing anything to actually help. They're just getting attention because they mm -hmm. feel like they should or they feel like they ought to. Yeah. Anyway, Dude, don't get me started with online. I know. BS. I know. BS. <laughs> yeah. OK, uh, I got another one. Should citizens obey unjust laws? Oh, oh, this is yeah. Should if 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 you think that law is unjust, should you still follow it? Well, I think this is actually if you look back in history, like the major events where we've tried to change laws is because we think they are unjust or immoral. Morality is usually the metric on which we we confront the law, right, and say that it's wrong. So when like things are being applied unfairly to like one group versus another, you know, that's oftentimes if you look at like the uh, civil rights movement was a good example of that. So I don't think we I actually don't think we should. I think if laws are unjust, I don't I think we should. I don't think we should. Well, let me rephrase that. I think we should take steps to try and change them mm -hmm. to make them correct or to make them better. But it's hard because, you know, we live in a system that has flaws. So, you know, laws are used for a lot of reasons. And I don't think laws are always just. They're definitely not always moral because they don't have anything to do with morality necessarily. And a lot of times they're self-interested. So, you know, it is a problem. Yeah, these things frustrate the heck out of me. I know, like right? laws and taxes. They're like two things that everybody has to deal with, but they're things that are very, very difficult to deal with yourself. Yeah. Because, I mean, the book of tax code is like this freaking big. And yeah, then it's huge. Who, and then you're supposed to you're supposed to be aware of every law that applies to you. And it's like, oh, yeah. where can you find a list of every law that applies to you? How are you supposed to be? And it's like, if you go to court, you can't represent yourself because you're just going to go to prison. You have to hire a lawyer yeah. who's basically just a freaking criminal, in my opinion. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Not to mention, like, too, a lot. How can, how can you sleep at night when you represent somebody who clearly did it? Like, I just yeah. don't get that stuff. Well, you know, it's crazy, too, because, like, the other thing is, like, a lot of laws, too, have been literally designed or or practiced or applied in ways where they intentionally target certain groups, peoples, et cetera. And so it's like, how can you follow a system like that when it's intentionally built to give some people a leg up and others a leg down, you know, or like, you know, look at like the, you know, lobbying. Lobbying is intentionally trying to change the law so that it benefits certain groups. I mean, that's insane. Those laws are clearly not fair and clearly not mm -hmm. right if all you're looking for is self-interested benefit. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so I guess for me, answering the question, should you obey laws if you think they're not just? I mean, the, yes, you probably should. Like, I, you know how oh, there's oh, like... should. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know how there's like the whole like uh, your uh, chaotic, lawful, good or evil like or neutral from there's this so basically like you can go towards the more chaos or more lawful stuff you can go towards more good or more evil so anyways uh i'm more of the lawful even though even though it irks the heck out of me that something well, like i i mean taxes i every year pay the government a ton of money i think i think and it also just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where does it go? I think it's I'm, also I'm totally on... I totally don't think the taxes are just at all, and yet I follow this law. Well, I think also depends on the law too, right? Because like laws like you use civil rights again, right? Laws that intentionally were aimed at certain groups. I don't think they. Sh I think somebody ha you have to you have to work against it in order to change it, right? So I think sometimes if the laws are unjust enough, we have to disobey them to some extent in order to make them change. Right. Other times I think though, yeah, you're better off just following him because it's like, you know, you're one person. Or like how about how about uh Muhammad Ali not going to Vietnam? You know? They had a draft, there was a law, he didn't go. He didn't believe it. I mean, yeah. I think that was a great opinion on his choice. So yeah, I would say no, it, was. it depends on the situation, I guess. It does. It's very yeah, it's a tough one though. That is a tough one. Mm -hmm. Um oh here's a, here's an interesting question. Um mm -hmm. should we judge acts? Based on their outcomes alone. So I guess another way. To <laughs> yeah, the end justifies the means. Yeah, totally. Always, always. <laughs> Machiavelli would agree. <laughs> or I guess more broadly, like, what do you think? How should we evaluate actions? That might be an easy way to say it. I'm I'm a big fan of uh, 
Well, so like the the outcomes are always out of your control. Yeah. So like I uh I think that what is within your control, like the actual actions are more worthwhile to evaluate. But then again, there's this whole thing of like someone with good in like I had good intentions, but yeah. and it's like that thing, it's like okay, but maybe you were going about it the wrong way at the same time. So like I yeah well no what you're saying though, i think is good we're like our, our so like if you're if you're looking at it from an intention standpoint consequences are valuable to inform you know those choices that you did make it's like if i intend to do something good but it comes out bad well i should learn from that right i should learn that okay even if my heart might have been in the right place or my intent was in the right place clearly that wasn't the right way to go about it right so I think consequences should weigh in in that sense where like they can help us evaluate after the fact the choices that we made and be useful moving forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But not necessarily think... the only thing. Because sometimes, you know, too, like, like you know, like telling the truth to somebody might make them upset, but that also might be important information to have. So like you can't always look at consequences. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a difficult one. Like I look at a lot more in terms of uh, trying to achieve certain results that you want in situations in that, I always just look at the actions and I say the results will come on their own accord. Because I believe, like, if you plant enough seeds, eventually you'll reap what you sow. But uh, I really like looking at it too in terms of character, right? Like, who am I? And what kind of actions, like, actually represent me, you know, in that sense? I think that's also a good way to look at it. Because then you're focused not on outcomes, but on, you know, the person you are and the person you become, rather. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah. Nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, how about okay? This is a funny one. Uh, are human rights and entitlement the same thing? Yeah, right is an entitlement. <laughs> I mean, it's like by definition, a right is an entitlement to something. Is it not? I mean, you know, I guess it depends. Like, do they mean like? I don't know what they mean because a right is an entitlement to something. I don't understand what they mean. Well, I, I was just thinking about these like <laughs> middle class kids who are like, I should have a freaking Tesla in high school because everybody else has one. And I'm thinking that like entitled. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I mean, a right is an entitlement to something, but yeah, like enti- like self ent- or entitled in that sense, is a little different. I mean, it's interesting because yeah. like another interesting question too about rights are like, are they are rights something that we have or are they something that we gain like a privilege like do you have to earn them or is or should they be earned or should they just be granted without any question Mm. yeah well this is a tricky one because i think that it's important to have human rights but i absolutely 100 percent believe that we have zero rights by like just by being alive like the only the only right we have by being alive is death that's literally the only yeah. right that we have because that's the only thing that's guaranteed. Everything else is literally a privilege on top of that. Well, they're all, it's a human construct. I mean, rights are a human construct, right? And I think, like you said, like I think having a, an idea of human rights is a good idea because it's a guide. It can help us understand, like, you know, are we doing things that are way outside the realm of like what would be acceptable or not? But I think on an individual level, two people should have to like also earn them to a certain extent in the sense that like if you're not acting, well towards others do you you really shouldn't have all those rights either then because you know you're not doing the same to others you're not treating them the same way so why bother yeah i think like i actually this is an interesting question with the words that they chose because i actually think that human rights bred this culture of entitlement like right now we're in this culture of entitlement where people are like i should have this and this and they should do this for me and i should have this and this should be guaranteed wearing a mask is taking away my freedom Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. People are so freaking entitled, they forget how lucky yeah. they are to have the human rights that they have. And they also forget about the, how their actions influence the rest of the community entirely. They don't think about that either. And I think you're right. Like, I think that entitlement side of it is dangerous because it leads to sort of only thinking about yourself and being narcissistic rather than thinking about how your actions also influence everyone else. Mm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Your okay, question. so it's a slightly better question than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Is it your question or mine? It's yours. I'll do another one. 
I thought I just did the right one, didn't I? Just ask that or did you? Okay, Danny. Okay, this sorry. is a question. <laughs> what makes someone fall in love? <laughs> I really want to know. <laughs> I really, really want to know. I don't know. It's tough. I think it's like, you know, I think, I think it's got to be different for every people, right? I mean, it's part of it's going to be physicality. Part of it's going to be relationship building, you know, forming a good relationship with people and friendship. I always think that becoming friends with people first is better because you get to know them on different terms than a romantic relationship and get to kind of see them differently. And that gives you a way to understand them more as a person. I think that's helpful. Mm. Yeah, I think <clears throat> there's definitely a ton of different factors that go into it. Oh, yeah. uh, I like what you said there with being friends first, because the longer that you spend together before you get married, the greater the the greater the chance of success for the marriage. Yeah, which is absolutely yeah. And uh, but also like I'm so interested in like the chemical thing because there's oh, yeah. there's definitely like there's some people that you that you see them you smell them, whatever it is. And it just like does something in your brain. Oh and yeah. There's definitely something there. It's freaking nuts. And the coolest thing is that it's different for everybody. Like yeah. I love, yeah. I love when I see a girl and I'm just like, Oh my God, look at her. And my friend's like, Ooh, like that's the yeah. coolest thing for me because then I'm like, well, awesome. No competition whatsoever. And it's just like, reminds me of different strokes for different folks. Yeah, no, everybody is different. That is funny, though, too. It is funny how that works, where everybody is attracted to something different and, like, wants something different. But I think, like... <laughs> Every trash yeah. can has a lid. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. It's <laughs> funny, though. It is. Like, I think... I don't know. I think, you know, it's hard, too, because I think a lot of times when we're looking for it, we aren't ourselves. You know, we put on yeah. airs. And then that causes <laughs> problems as well. So I think, like... I do think like trying to be ourselves and trying to be friends first is very helpful. But yeah, I don't know what the chemical stuff is, but I'm sure that there's gotta be something there. Oh, Definitely. Yeah. I also I've been reading a lot of Shakespeare recently, and I love reading Shakespeare because like these guys fall head over heels in love from just they like they literally like see a girl for the first time and they're like, This is it. it. I will murder anybody who <laughs> and myself. Thinks, who said, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's like, it's like the most drastic love thing ever. And then, like, uh, which one was it? It was, much, I think, like, Much Ado About Nothing, where the dude literally fell head over heels in love, and then these other guys lied to him and said that she wasn't a virgin, and all of a sudden he's, like, cursing her and, like, <laughs> she, and saying the worst stuff about her. And then and then he finds out that's not true, and all of a sudden he's head over heels in love again. It's just like, it's like absurd. He's, he's like the most drastic drama queen ever, just flipping back and forth. They totally <laughs> are, though. They're so dramatic. Uh, what was it? Uh, oh. Has modern technology made us more or less human? Mm, or less. humane. I'm sorry. It was humane. Oh, humane. <laughs> <laughs> less. I would, okay, so I'm going to answer the first question first. I think modern technology has made us less human to begin with. If you want to know why, a great book called Sapiens talks about what it was like to be a human. We've lost like everything that it was to be human. However, <clears throat> I think why that is eventually... That, but why does that define what a human is, though? Because a human is also something that adapts. If we went by that definition, we would never have changed. We would have stayed more. Well, that's what I'm getting to. Is okay. that we, it, we are adapting, but we adapt pretty slowly. Yes. Like, I think part of this adaptation is all the anxiety we see in the world, all the depression we see in the world, all the obesity we see in the world. Like, all these things are part of the adaptation, but it takes a long freaking time. And it's going to it's going to end up being like, uh, whoever reads more, whatever, that's those are the things that are going to be passed on. I, I think eventually we'll find people that are somewhat resistant to the downsides of technology like the people who continue and keep breeding will be the people who don't get depressed from it the people who don't get all these like diseases of affluence from it you know so no, it's true though and you know we are we're very good at like coming up with inventions but these things that drastically change our world they also take a lot of time for us to adjust to and i think you're right like that will happen over time where you know the people that 
survive, the people that breed will be the ones that probably dealt with it the best way or in a healthy way, because that's just how we are. So it's interesting, though, because like the concept of human is so flexible and plastic, I guess, that it makes it hard to even define it, you know? And it's crazy how much things have. Okay, so like I'm reading this book on Alaska right now, and it was talking about the gold rush. That's a big book, isn't it? Oh, dude, it's like 30 some hours. And so uh, it's talking about the gold rush in the 1800s. And I was like, hang on. That was 200 years ago, the gold yeah. rush. Like, you're kidding me. When, when, like, you look at the whole span of humanity and then the gold rush, which I think is like ancient history, was yeah. 200 years ago. Dude, I do that all and, the time with American history, though, where I'm like, like, even World War One was in, like, it was like barely 100 years ago. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. I think yeah. that is so much longer. It's really weird. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, the amount of change just gone because. You know, up until that time, we pretty much lived outside. We yeah. pretty much didn't have clocks and schedules and alarm clocks and all this. No airplanes, stuff. no cars, no manufacturing. No. <laughs> we were bored all the freaking time. Like people die. The average life expectancy was 30. So yeah. like all these things changed very, very drastically. And while we're trying to catch up with it, it's. You know, it's such a quick change. Humans don't evolve that quickly. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah, it's so what were you going to say? Oh, no, I, say, I just, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. I think that it is interesting. And like, whether I think on the humane side, I don't know. It's interesting because technology has given us access to things that could have made. I think technology gives us access that could help a lot. But the problem is how it's used, right? And what we pay attention to. We tend to see more negative stuff now more i think more um bad examples of society and that can make us more inhumane because we care less about those people because we see that and then we judge them so i think like having a broader so maybe that'll change with time you know as we start to adjust to these things over time who knows but i think it can have both positive and negative effects depending on its usage obviously yeah it's funny because they thought technology was going to make to give us like a life of luck yeah. of like uh freedom of leisure they thought that i think I, I forget exactly what the statistics were but they thought by the early 2000s people were going to be working about like 14 hours a week well that was right? always the dream right was you invent these things to do the things you don't want to do to free up your time to do other stuff but all it does is end up binding us to more different tasks right uh-huh. yeah that, i mean we remember we were talking about how henry ford invented the the whatever the line so that people could spend more time enjoying nature yeah like, and then they just it. destroyed nature. Yeah. Um, but as for humane, I think technology makes us a lot less humane. Like, people are freaking nasty on technology. Like, nasty like they would never be in real life. They're nasty yeah. on technology. That animated, you know, gives them a chance to be, you know, totally nasty. Yeah. Yeah. And even, like, you know, some people will say, but but now I can give my thoughts and prayers to people when there's, and like, after I punch that person in the mouth, it's <laughs> yeah, like, right. it, that, that doesn't help at all. It doesn't. And no. yeah. So I wonder if it makes us more disconnected because viewing things through a screen gives them that sense in which it's not connected to you. You know, you're watching something it's voyeuristic. So mm -hmm. there's that separation. Dude, it's, it's literally addictive. Like, one thing that I did, I was telling you this about this a while ago, is I changed my screen so it's just grayscale. It's black and white. And, like, I noticed a significant difference. Like, when every once in a while I'll need I'll do something where, like, I need to see a color on my phone. And so I'll turn that off. And literally it looks like candy. It is yeah. oh, freaking yeah. addictive as heck. And I, it's just, like, you end up getting addicted to this stuff because that's what it's designed to do. Because they're like, hey, money's right. more important than anything else. Why not even, let's just get people not even that too. Even when, they're, when we design things, we want to make them appealing, right? Whether we know it or not, we want to make them appealing. And screens can be very appealing because they can flash all kinds of colors and they're sound. You know, it can, it can be very appealing to our senses because it overwhelms it's, you. It's know. super freaking saturated. Like, I notice yeah. this all the time now is I see other people taking pictures and I look on their phone. And their phone is way more saturated than the actual nature. Yes. And it's just like, this is a crazy disparity because this draw this little phone draws your eye more than reality. I mean, that's one of the things, like, it's funny because I, you know, when I use my regular camera to take pictures, 
I like to try and get pictures that like are closer to like what I'm actually looking at, you know. And it's funny because as technology has improved, I notice more and more people are favoring photos online that are more manipulated in post production. So that they have that saturation, those contrasts that like are not real. And it's fine, it's whatever, but like it does change it a lot. It makes us, you know, look for more like um digital things rather than real things. Yeah, there was there was a photography book I used to have called Black and White Photography that was like a really nice book of photos that had high contrast, but it was like things that you found out in nature of blacks and whites and gray yeah. scales and different Well, stuff it's neat because like you can change you can make things like you can give a different perspective on something just by contrast and stuff like that. You're not changing the image, but you know, you're giving a perspective on it. Right. But then the digital age has changed things dramatically in that respect. I think it definitely has. Mm -hmm. Things look more like CGI, you know, than they do. like. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, here's an interesting one. Okay. Since you're like the love guru, <laughs> do all human beings want to be loved? be loved do all human beings want to be loved i would say yes i think we all do want to be like i think i don't know i kind of do think that we have a natural need for community obviously i mean we seem to think it's weird when somebody goes like off into nature by themselves and just lives alone forever that seems odd to us uh, and even if we do like our personal space right we want to have community and we also want people around us that we know there's because love it like it's that connection that's different from everyone else right like, you know, you, you know, you can rely on those people, you know, those people are part of your life in a certain way. So I think it's a way to share our life experiences with. So I think, yeah, we absolutely do. Mm. Yeah. Do all people, I would say, I would say, uh, do all human beings want to be loved? You know, initially, I would say initially when they pop out of the womb, I would say yes, but then stuff happens and people change and things, whatever and stuff gets twisted and like your neurology changes based on what happens to you. And I would say that like, as some people may not, like it may be repulsive to some people as they, as it's they, possible. I think initially, initially, yes. Cause like they had all that stuff with the babies that I forget what syndrome it was where like the babies would die if they didn't get held when they were, yeah, they will. Absolutely, like, it's, yeah. a, it's a requirement for life. But eventually it can shift. And I think some like, you know, it's not these people's fault, but like stuff can get twisted and people could eventually not want love. That can happen, I guess. Yeah. I mean, there's always outliers. That's the difficulty. Right. But I think that <laughs> I think we definitely. Huh? What did he say? <laughs> no, he still he still wanted love, too. Yeah. yeah. Everybody wants love. You would think. Right. I um, I have a theory that like. We could do away with war pretty much everywhere if guys just were getting laid often enough. <laughs> Who's going to want to go to war and kill somebody if they if they just got laid? If people just had nobody. love in their lives, you just need love yeah, in your lives. That's all you need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, that's a funny one. Sorry, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll do a couple more. All right, we'll do a couple more. Um, how? Do I know what's true? Ooh, yeah, that's an interesting one because the world really only tells you about your own uh, nervous system. It yeah. really only tells you what, because like your experience of the world depends on what you see, which is based on your eyes, depends on what you hear, based on your ears, your brain, like all this different stuff. And how do I know? Which, it's really interesting because when I read, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. It drove me nuts yeah, that he was looking that. for the one universal truth that was the same for every single person. And Doesn't he exist. was going to find the truth that was true for everybody. And he was right. And like that bothered the heck out of me. Cause it's like, yes, there are universal truths. Sure. But like to think that it's going to be exactly the same for you and for everybody else that's got to be crazy. I and, mean, that's the uh, definition of a universal truth, though, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but like... <laughs> no, I know, I, I know. Mean, just... Well, so, like, okay, so here's the thing. Okay, we're looking at universal truths. So, like, everybody loves to quote quantum mechanics and different stuff like that. But it's like, okay, 
universal truth. Light acts as a wave. True. Okay. Light acts as a particle. True. How can two things that are completely opposite be true simultaneously at the same time? And it's like, don't know, but they are. And so it's like this whole thing of like one universal truth, like universal truth, light acts as, I don't know. And no, I get what you're saying. Like, you know, it's okay. So I would say that, you know, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Thanks, don't Danny. I feel, I feel you're better. fine. <laughs> I don't think it matters. I think I don't. Well, okay. I, I mean, I fall on a different side. I don't think there is truth, strictly speaking. I think we have perspective, you know, it's, I can know things from my standpoint and, you know, understand that things are a construct. Like, you know, I'm very much influenced by being raised in the United States and very much influenced in how I see the world from, you know, my experiences, my history, all of that. So like, for sure, like, you know, I have might have certain truths for me, but I think they depend on your perspective wholly. And I don't think there is any like truth beyond that. Even the sciences and stuff are constructed up to a point and they give us a way of interpreting reality. So everything comes down to is an interpretation from a specific standpoint. So I don't really necessarily believe in like absolute truths or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, it's you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Yeah. Well, I think it's also good to think that way, too, because it keeps you open and flexible and rather than dogmatic and rigid in your thinking, which is much mm -hmm. better to be open because it's that you stay curious and you're also willing to change your, your views if, you know, you come upon evidence that suggests otherwise. Yeah, because how often does your opinion change in life? I mean, like things that you knew to be true at one point are no longer like there was a long time where I thought that no carb diet was the way to go. That a long freaking like I've never thought time. that. I like carbs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a long freaking time. And then I realized that it wasn't. So, yeah. I mean, also, uh, I know that I I mean, I am always right, and so. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> Ooh, here we go. This is my last one. All right. Is stealing ever permissible? Is stealing ever permissible? Okay, I'm going to say this. I think the statute of limitations <laughs> yeah, right? is, is long enough on it. <laughs> no, I was going to say... <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so that question I think is funny because you know the way it's phrased, it's saying like, is it ever morally right to steal, right, or is it ever justified in that sense? And I think sometimes like it might just be the case that sometimes morality doesn't apply. That there's other things that are more important. Let me give you an example. If you're starving and have no money, and the only way to eat is to say maybe steal from somewhere. I think that it that it's not an issue of permissibility, it's an issue of survival, right? So I think there is a difference there that like maybe that's not the right way to frame the question that sometimes other things will trump morality, right? Which makes it in a sense permissible under certain conditions maybe if you want to think of it that way, but does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, dude, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a freaking gray area. Like I love that example yeah. that you gave with the whole eating because I used to love going dumpster diving especially behind Trader Joe's because <laughs> literally stuff that expired that day would be out there in the dumpsters and you could yeah. find like you could literally go home with hundreds of dollars of stuff that expired that day and anybody who knows anything about food knows that like that when that date that they give you stuff I mean maybe milk you know can expire on not that even day. do you know there's different but, days in different states because they all set those restrictions so it's totally like in a sense arbitrary too yeah but like a lot of this stuff is you have a very big window around that. And so like Yeah, so just crazy. because they can't sell it, why isn't it used? Right. And it's like technically, if you're in their if they have if they have a little fence thing around their garbage can, you're stealing because you're breaking and entering yes, you are, to yeah. go into the trash can. But it's like, okay, fine. So you're breaking and entering. How about how about like the squirrel that like hops in there and eats that stuff? Is that guy stealing too? Is he breaking the law too? <laughs> and it's like, well, no, because laws don't apply to squirrels. And it's like, hmm, so this is a human law that prevents me from doing the same thing that squirrels. Uh, it, it's a gray area to me. You know what I never understood? It is a gray area. And you know what I never understood about too? All the places that throw food out like that because of expiration dates. And that food's not bad. I don't never understood why we don't, I get why we don't donate it because they're afraid if something happens, they'll get sued or whatever, yeah. or it'll hurt their market. But like, you know, there's uh it's just ridiculous dude i remember one day we went there and had like literally filled up an entire car with like there was so much 
there that it was just absurd. Because we do, because our whole our whole society is built around waste, though. You have to have more than you're going to need to sell it. And so they're just constantly throwing stuff out. It's still good. It's insane. Yeah, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think it is a gray area, though. Mm-hmm. And they clearly don't but want it. So. I, would say, I would say still, you know, in ter- is stealing ever... I try not to steal because I know that, like, when I steal, I don't feel good. Yeah. There are certain gray areas. Like, I would still go take food from Trader Joe's. Okay? I don't look at that as stealing because they threw the damn stuff out. Like, who, who yeah. cares? If, yeah. But, like, and and I'm taking the risk by eating food that is expired. Yeah. But other other stealing, it doesn't make me feel good. Like, when I steal something from somebody... And then I see them missing it and they don't, and they like, I see the pain that I've caused them. I don't feel good. So for me, like, it's just not worth it. No, I think too, when the, when there's a distinction between like survival, like if you you need food to eat, like if you're starving and the only way to get food is to steal it, that's one thing. But like, if you're just stealing a, a watch because you think it's nice or something that's totally different that's like unnecessary so i think it also is a it's also a scale of you know how desperate is your situation and you know how relevant is this thing to helping survival for now or something like that mm-hmm. yeah Good interesting one. question though Should we do, do one more other questions yeah sure last question no pressure thanks <laughs> <laughs> well I'm going to ask you this just because I'm curious what determines the difference between fact and fiction fact and fiction hmm damn you know that's a great one because I don't know it's it's kind of like we like the his, any history book is, so like for instance okay we have these u.s history books that we learned from in america i guarantee they're probably different from a chinese history book or a russian history book or just think of the way Canadian we represent history well, book think about the way anybody represents like the, like the founding fathers in america how we represent them in history books they come across as really good people <laughs> like we leave a lot of their lives just out into the side you know uh-huh. And it's like, because history, you're always getting a glance of something and somebody always has an intent or story they're trying to tell. So it's always going to be like manipulated on that uh, line. Dude, okay. So uh, another thing that I learned in this Alaska book. So like, you know how there's tension between Russia and America right Let's now? Let's just do an episode on Alaska just from that book. I know, right? It's a, it's a great, like, I've, it's crazy because I'm only a third of the way through it. I've been feel like I've been reading it forever. I've learned so much stuff. But like, <laughs> Russia was one of the few countries that actually uh, early on when there was the civil war in America, they came in and they defended the shores of America from England and France invading and taking America. Like Russia literally saved the United States. The only reason the United States is still here is because Russia parked their like their all their naval ships down across the coast. And they just stopped anyone from coming in and taking America while we were fighting amongst what, ourselves. Along the West Coast, you mean? No, the East Coast. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. I had no idea yeah. they did that. Huh. Yeah. I know. I just learned that from this book. And I'm like, if, if anybody knew this stuff, I think the tensions would go away because clearly there's just something going well, on that's... right now where we're having like brotherly and sisterly squabbles because clearly we owe our whole country to them. But that's the funny thing, though, right, is that, you know, I mean, any story from the past is always told under a certain light. And with all these, you know, they leave things out on purpose because of political tensions and stuff. They don't want to give a nod to somebody because, you know, they're in fight with them right now. It's like, and that's the problem, right? Like fact and fiction are difficult because I think we tell stories, we create meaning. So nothing is exactly as it is. You know, we don't even know the world as it really is. We only know it from a human perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is that your answer? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> right. No, so yeah. no, you can't tell yeah. the difference. Sometimes you can. I mean, you know, but not always. It's hard. Yeah, it's it's difficult because I mean, gosh, people look at the news for facts. Like, oh, you know, I know, especially especially older generation. Like they grew up where they could trust the news, and now I don't. I don't. I would. I 
they would the news would be the last place that I would go to find yeah. something that's truthful. Well, do you know what's funny? I was thinking about that the other day, like because I was talking to my dad, and like I remember like, when I was younger, and the news. Remember the news was on for like a half hour in the morning, half hour at night, mm-hmm. and most of it was it was pretty factual because they didn't spend a lot of time on stuff. They spent a few minutes on each story, and they would just tell you like core facts of these big issues, right? And it but wasn't they went opinion. To, it wasn't yes. outrage porn. It wasn't like. Yeah, but once they went to that twenty-four hour schedule, they had to fill time, and everything started to become very skewed by a certain perspective or certain ideas in order to get that audience. And so, yeah, it's become garbage. Whereas before, I think before it was a, there was a little bit more integrity in it. They might not, have, there might have always been perspectives to it because it's people telling stories, of course. But like, it was better. I think now it's gotten just way more to the point where it's barely even like, it, it's barely even giving you any information about the issues at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so there you have it. Some more thought provoking <laughs> don't trust philosophical anything. questions. I know. <laughs> don't trust it. I mean, that's basically the answer. Don't trust anyone. You can't. And uh yeah. yeah. So you if you enjoyed the episode, like, share, subscribe, give us a good review. Also, there's a uh if you're looking for something to fill some time, there's a survey down in the show notes or the description. This is the Existential Stoic Podcast. I'm Randy. That's Danny. I'll see you later, Danny. Later, Randy.